Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining the Surrey Board of Trade this afternoon. I'm Anita Haberman, CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade. I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, that we are on the unceded territory of our Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen, Ketsi, Simiamu, and Tawasin First Nations. We're so pleased to have BC's Transportation and Infrastructure Minister Rob Fleming with us, as well as Minister Bowen Ma, and they're going to be introduced more formally uh, later on. Events like this simply do not happen without sponsorship support. Uh, so I thank you so much for supporting the Surrey Board of Trade. Our presenting sponsors, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority and Rogers Communications Canada. Our supporting sponsor is CN. Our community sponsor is the Downtown Surrey Business Improvement Association. And our business and international trade center sponsors are the law firm of Faskin and the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan represented by SNF Benefits. Thank you so much for supporting us. I'd also like to recognize some government officials that are with us uh, this afternoon on our Zoom call. First of all, Gary Begg, MLA for Surrey Guilford. Jagru Brar, MLA for Surrey Fleetwood. Stephanie Cadu, MLA for Surrey South. His Worship, the Mayor of Abbotsford, Henry Braun. His Worship, the Mayor of the City of Burnaby, Mike Hurley. His Worship, the Mayor of the City of Coquitlam, Richard Stewart. And His Worship, Mayor of White Rock, Daryl Walker. His Worship, the Mayor of Port Coquitlam, Brad West. Her Worship, the Mayor of the City of Langley, Val Vandenbrook. City of Surrey Councillor, Linda Annis. City of Pitt Meadow Councillor, Bob Meachin. And the Consulate General of Ireland, based here in Vancouver, Frank Flood. Thank you so much for joining us. Transportation in, and infrastructure investments are so important, not only to Surrey, but the Metro Vancouver region. Just a few reminders, all attendees are on mute. If you do have a question, please put it in the chat function of the technology and I will get to your question after our keynote addresses. If we're not able to respond to your questions, a formal answer will be sent to you by email. I'd like to begin by just saying and reminding you that the Surrey Board of Trade is Surrey City Building Business Organization. We're the top 10, one of the top 10 largest chambers of commerce boards of trades in Canada. There's 450 of us. We support business, bring business into the city through a diversified portfolio of services, being that concierge of connections, especially during this pandemic and beyond. We focus on global business connections for local businesses, instigating change at different levels of government, uh, providing those cost-saving, time-saving benefits. You name it, we do it right here at the Surrey Board of Trade, where we've also created Canada's first COVID-19 playbook for business. Surrey is going to be the largest city in British Columbia very soon. And I wanted you to just see a video just to tell you a little bit more about our great and amazing city and the Surrey Board of Trade. The video, please. It is a fact that the economic powerhouse is in Surrey as we become the largest city in British Columbia. That brings opportunity with the largest amount of industrial land inventory, a border crossing city with our largest trading partner and an international docking facility that brings in goods from all over the world. The Surrey Board of Trade represents 6,000 member contacts and over 60,000 employees. You're invited to work together with the Surrey Board of Trade as we set the stage to become BC's largest city. 
the Surrey Board of Trade connects you to a network of businesses and professionals locally and internationally. Take your business further, expand your brand, and let the Surrey Board of Trade's government advocacy help your business and your economy. Experience the value of our unparalleled service delivery for your business. Business connections, workplace training, international trade center, government advocacy, business and entrepreneurial center, industry development. The Surrey Board of Trade, here to support your business and attract business. Become a member today. Visit businessinsurrey.com. Surrey, where business happens. Thank you so much for watching that. And I just wanted to also indicate that every year we do a annual Surrey Road Survey. And we do that in conjunction when the Transportation Minister for British Columbia speaks. And I just wanted to offer our fifth annual Surrey Road Survey results that were released this morning. They are on our website at businessinsurrey.com. And I just wanted to give you a glimpse of some of the highlights and uh, not surprising results are really very similar to last year. Uh, but of course, we know that congestion has continued to increase, uh, even uh, in the middle of a pandemic. So we do need to focus on those transportation and infrastructure investments to ensure that Surrey, the South Fraser Economic Region, and all of British Columbia continue to be leaders. Transportation is the foundation of our economy. So just uh, to share uh, some of the results uh, with you. Number one, the purpose of the road survey is to assist the city of Surrey road improvement planning processes. Uh, the city of Surrey has actually provided some questions uh, within the survey itself to help them in their planning. And we've done that with them uh, for the past four years and now into our fifth year. We want to gain an understanding of our members commute and business travel trends. We want to determine any actions, recommendations or policies that may be required by different levels of government or in partnership with each other and we want to instigate change. So traffic congestion impact on business operations. To over 25% indicated there was a limited impact to business operations in the year 2020. Over 50% indicated traffic congestion somewhat Im impacted business operations. And uh, just under 24% indicated traffic congestion had a significant impact on business operations. The top three corridors to be improved in Surrey are Fraser Highway, widen it to four lanes between Wally Boulevard and 148th Street, including through Green Timbers Park. 152nd Street widened to four lanes from 40th to 50th Avenue and 64th Avenue widened to five lanes between 176th Street and Fraser Highway. And just keep in mind that our population continues to grow by 1,200 to 1,400 people a month. And yes, that's even during a pandemic. Our top three intersections requiring improvement, 64th Avenue and 168th Street, significant backlog on that corridor. 104 Avenue and 156th Street, Fraser Highway and 184th Street. Transit needs, we need rapid transit on Fraser Highway. We need rapid transit between Guilford City Center and Newton on King George Boulevard and 104 Avenue. And respondents said that they need a new B-Line bus service to South Surrey White Rock. So we need east-west solutions and north-south solutions. And in terms of bridges, we've always stated this uh, to the province that Patello Bridge should open with six lanes instead of four lanes. 
and that our position has always been and respondents continue to say that the Massey Tunnel should be a bridge instead of a tunnel. There's more to share with you, of course, uh, but uh, just take a look. Uh, it's about a 15 page report on our website, businessinsurrey.com and uh, just uh, plenty of work to do in collaboration with our all levels of government to ensure that we have those transit and transportation infrastructure investments. So with that, I'd like to introduce our co-presenting sponsor representative. He is the Vice President of Access Networks for Western Canada for Rogers Communications Canada. Warren Fletcher, please say a few words. Okay, just bear with me two seconds while I share my presentation. Okay, so I'd like to start by thanking the Surrey Board of Trade for hosting today's event. Rogers is a proud member of the Surrey Board of Trade and share their visions of helping local businesses thrive and actively contribute to the growth of British Columbia's economy. My name is Warren Fletcher. I am the VP of Access Networks for Western Canada. Today's topic is particularly important to Rogers as we continue in our investment in the network infrastructure and collaboration with the construction, transportation, real estate and other industries to provide better connectivity for community, communities and for businesses. Before telling you more about our investments in our network, um, which is the key area for me, um, I wanted to quickly share a bit about our organization here in BC. Rogers is Canada's first 5G network. It's now live in over 50 communities in BC, including here in Surrey, and across 160 communities in Canada. Rogers employs more than 1,700 British Columbians, and we'll be adding additional 330 jobs created by the end of 2021 at our new Kelowna Customer Solutions Centre, increasing our ability to serve our customers locally. Many of our employees are based from the lower mainland, including Surrey, so we want to be sure we're supporting their local community and its businesses. Lastly, we invested over $4 million in community initiatives, including grants and funding for youth and local communities to support education and business development. I would now like to highlight Roger's significant investment in its network growth to support evolving businesses' needs, from supporting customers to delivering innovative advanced services. In 2019, Rogers launched a multi-year plan to enhance wireless services in our preparation to launch our 5G nationwide. It was also in response to the growing public demand for connectivity. As one of the largest and fastest growing communities in British Columbia, Surrey's residents of over half, half a million are targeted as a key recipient of Rogers investment. This represents millions and millions of dollars on building new wireless installations to support the city's fast expanding growth with 5G services and expanding our fiber footprint. Our projects are poised not only to support Surrey's residents working from home during the pandemic, but help businesses that ultimately restart our economic recovery process in Surrey. We have not slowed down on our targets because reliable connectivity is not only for our safety, but it is dependent on, upon by all of us to continue work during this difficult time. Rogers has a strong investment in innovation and developing emergency tech, emerging technologies, particularly in smart cities and transportation. Through our partnership with UBC, we have launched Canada's Excuse me, we launched Canada's first smart city in Kelowna, implementing LiDAR technology to monitor traffic flows and increase our public safety. These projects are part of Rogers' $20 million national investments in strategic partnerships at universities around the country. Today, our Rogers for Business and Network teams work closely with the transportation industry to define advanced connectivity solutions, ultimately helping to better serve their customers and communities. With that, I will hand back to Anita and I look forward to the rest of today's session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Warren, and thank you so much for your support to the Surrey Board of Trade. And now, please help me welcome our co-presenting sponsor representative. She is the Director of Community and Government Relations for the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, Evangeline Inglesos. Evangeline, over to you. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Anita, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here today for this very important discussion on BC's transportation and infrastructure plan. As the federal agency responsible for the stewardship of the lands and waters that make up the Port of Vancouver, our mandate as a Port Authority is to ensure goods are moved safely, efficiently, and sustainably. We work for the benefit of all Canadians in collaboration with our partners, our stakeholders, and other members of the port community. And our vision is to make the Port of Vancouver the world's most sustainable port, an ambitious and exciting vision indeed. The diversity of the cargo handled through the Port of Vancouver is one of the key strengths as it allows, us, uh, allows the port to be resilient through periods of economic downturn, such as right now. And although our economy has experienced many challenges over the last year, demand for Canadian import and export capacity is strong, which is very encouraging. The diverse cargo that is moved through the port represents communities across Canada who use the Port of Vancouver to reach export markets for the grain and the potash and other Canadian resources. And for the small to large businesses, both here in Surrey and across Canada, imports of consumer goods support manufacturing and retail markets. The port's continued strong performance is enabling the Port Authority to move forward despite the pandemic with the infrastructure projects. And to this end, we're leading more than a billion dollars worth of infrastructure projects with supply chain and commodity partners to improve goods movement to the port while also reducing impacts on communities. And we also complete extensive studies to assess and mitigate any potential impacts these projects may have on the environment so that we can support trade capacity across the lower mainland and increase and improve goods movement through the port sustainably. We are also investing heavily in container terminal capacity to service Canada's long-term demands. It's a key priority for us to meet Canada's long-term needs for container capacity. It, and it's with the proposed Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project. It is a nationally critical project, which if approved will increase the port's container capacity by a third. All of these projects are directly supporting our regional economic recovery by supporting jobs and helping sustain local co companies we contract with while also injecting the much needed investment dollars into our region. So with that, everyone, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm grateful for the strong partnerships between the Port Authority and our partners. And we all look forward to continuing to work together to keep Canada strong and competitive and our province as well. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Evangeline. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome BC's Minister of Transportation, the Honorable Rob Fleming. Rob, over to you. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking uh, an hour out of your busy schedules to uh, be here today with uh, Minister of State uh, Bowen Ma and I. And, uh, thank you very much to the Surrey Board of Trade and to you, Anita, for uh, organizing this opportunity. Uh, this afternoon. I'm speaking to you from uh, the Legislative Assembly in Victoria and I'm on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And uh, it's an honor uh, to join the Surrey Board of Trade today as the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. And I want to uh, also bring greetings to my fellow MLAs and elected officials, mayors and councillors who are on the call. And I think I would extend that on behalf of Premier John Horgan, who would uh, thank those elected officials and also be pretty excited as a guy from County Cork that the uh, Consul General of Ireland, uh, Mr. Frank Flood, has joined us this afternoon as well. Um, there has uh, been an awful lot to learn uh, over the past couple of months uh, since I've been appointed uh, as, as the Minister of Transportation. Uh, we have uh, had to navigate as a province uh, through a second wave of our provincial pandemic and as part of a global response uh, here in this province. Uh, it has challenged uh, all of us in every sector of the economy and business, as we know. Uh, many businesses and industries have been uh, hit very hard because of travel restrictions and other uh, health restrictions that have been necessary to provide an effective public health response 
uh, to COVID-19 and businesses have shown and had to be uh, incredibly resilient time and time again. And uh, we do face some uncertainties, of course, with variants uh, and, uh, and trends that are happening in other parts of the country that uh, require us to, uh, to continue to be uh, adaptive as we have been uh, thus far and keep people safe. Um, while there has been uh, uh, incredible turmoil in some sectors of the economy, it's important to, to uh, I think, uh, recognize that in British Columbia that while we've uh, adapted to the new reality of this virus, um, there have been a number of innovations, new technologies, new platforms that have been able to keep uh, many businesses uh, successfully afloat and in fact doing very well. Um, I'm very pleased in the transportation sector, for example, that the commercial trucking industry uh, has uh, recorded uh, significant volumes and uh, in many areas of the province is, is back to its pre-pandemic levels in volume. You heard from one of our sponsors as well around port traffic. I think we can be very proud as the number one port in the country that goods have been uh, imported and exported uh, almost at pre-pandemic levels uh, to date and the recovery there has been very strong. And I think it's also important that business voices like the Surrey Board of Trade and others in BC are predicting a very optimistic, strong uh, economic rate of growth in 2021. In fact, one of the uh, business uh, organizations in BC is predicting four and a half percent growth in 2021 and uh, even higher in 2022. And that will trend uh, above the Canadian average in terms of an economic recovery. And I think um, the last 11 months, of course, has put uh, all the provinces and governments around the world to the test. Uh, we've had to steer uh, our province uh, on a consistent course through the pandemic, try and provide stability. And it, 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 we've, we've had to make sure that it's not knocking, off, uh, knocking us off course of our other goals, which is to improve uh, health care for British Columbians and families more generally, uh, to invest in good jobs in our province and to make life more affordable for people. So while we have had economic uncertainty, we've been able to deliver on a number of key initiatives that have made uh, life more affordable for middle-class British Columbians. And we can be proud of that, uh, working together as a province. Um, in my ministry, we've been, we've been working to make transportation from the outset safer for people, no matter what mode of travel you use. Uh, we're also working uh, on the government's agenda of affordability to make uh, transportation more affordable, that, to make it more convenient, to make it more reliable. Uh, that includes people who rely on public transit to, to get to work each day, and it includes small business owners uh, who rely on uh, roads and, uh, and, and good uh, uh, policies in, in the transportation sector to support the movement of, uh, of goods and services. I am very fortunate uh, in this uh, uh, very <laughs> considerable endeavor as the Minister of Transportation to have uh, Bowen Ma, my colleague, as the Minister of State for Infrastructure uh, in Cabinet and within my ministry to, to help us keep on course for some of the top priorities uh, for communities around BC and indeed, as we heard in the video, for British Columbia's fastest growing and soon to be number one city, uh, Surrey. So uh, I'll, I'll look forward to hearing uh, from her and answering your questions uh, after my remarks. But I, I do want to start maybe just by saying that, uh, you know, often we're so busy in our lives that we, we haven't really reflected on the, the year that was. Uh, we have had a year where our lives have been dramatically uh, altered uh, under COVID-19. Um, we entered uh, the pandemic in BC as the uh, economic leader in Canada. We had the lowest unemployment rate. We had the strongest uh, job growth. And then uh, like other uh, provinces, we locked down in March and April. And, uh, and that was a very, very uh, scary time for all of us. Um, we were fortunate though, to have excellent public health leadership that guided us through uh, a phased reopening that began last May and gathered steam throughout the summer and into into the fall. And we were we were very fortunate to have valuable business voices like the Surrey Board of Trade advise us on how to do that. Um, the second wave of the pandemic has been a long struggle and we all appreciate that. Uh, but it is worth mentioning that we're making some progress. Uh, we, we're continuing to hear about uh, significant job losses in the rest of the country. Uh, it is somewhat good news to hear that in, in January, BC, in the latest labor force survey recorded uh, uh, adding a, about 3000 extra jobs and it marked the ninth straight month of uh, job growth in the province of BC. And in fact, I think we are now tipped over 98% of uh, pre-pandemic uh, employment le uh, levels in, 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 in BC. We continue to have the lowest unemployment 
level of all the uh, four major uh, uh, provinces in the country and it's well below the national average. And, and I think that's a testament to business owners uh, innovation and determination uh, to be able to, uh, to do commerce and, uh, and to uh, continue to run their companies and businesses. Uh, in the transportation sector, um, we've helped uh, in BC uh, to weather better than most uh, jurisdictions uh, on a number of indicators. One is we've kept uh, transportation projects going, uh, heavy duty construction on roads and, uh, and, and transportation projects throughout BC has continued almost without interruption. Uh, and we owe a debt of gratitude to agencies like WorkSafe BC and the Provincial Health Office working with the BC Road Builders Association and our transportation authorities uh, to be able to do that. We also have benefited from heroic sacrifices from workers that were deemed essential in, in the transportation sector. That includes transit operators, it includes uh, truck drivers, uh, it includes uh, people that service those vehicles and, uh, and the sector has really rallied to the importance uh, of, uh, of transportation to everybody's well-being and the supply chain of the province. So we do owe them a huge debt of gratitude and I, I, I don't wanna miss any opportunity to thank them uh, personally. We also have a little bit more uncertainty in these uncertain times uh, as a result of our partnership with the federal government and having a very strong productive uh, working relationship uh, with the federal government uh, has paid a number of dividends, not the least of which is the safe restart funding that we announced uh, in an agreement just a couple of months ago in December, over a billion dollars in guaranteed funding through the uh, recovery period for uh, our three major transportation authorities, uh, TransLink, which will receive over $644 million of that funding, uh, BC Ferries, which keeps uh, all of our coastal communities uh, connected, and BC Transit, which is our crown corporation that operates uh, in over 60 communities, uh, a bus-based uh, primarily transit service. Um, those uh, agencies, those authorities have been uh, experiencing uh, heavy operating losses, uh, ridership levels uh, decreased significantly and are still relatively low uh, as they begin to recover. Uh, and those funds are also, and we were able to negotiate this with Ottawa, uh, can be targeted to protect affordability. And we'll continue to do that to make sure that fare increases are not a feature of, of rebuilding. We want to rebuild the service and attract ridership back and having the service levels on the road by having those funds uh, to help the authorities uh, maintain themselves is critically important. So we're very, very uh, fortunate and very thankful uh, to have had a, a very strong federal partner uh, in that regard. There's also been some good news uh, that uh, is worthy of further exploration in terms of the, the details of what it means, but it, it, it bodes well, and uh, I speak specifically of Prime Minister Trudeau's announcement that there'll be an additional $15 billion available for public transit systems over the next decades, um, uh, or rather over the next eight years uh, across the country. We, we can anticipate a fairly healthy share of that uh, in TransLink for Metro Vancouver. Um, what it represents, I suppose, while we await some of the details, is a commitment to stable, predictable transit funding, which is something that the province and uh, and some of the mayors who are on this, uh, who are joining us this afternoon, have advocated for a very, very long time. Um, so that uh, that that is good. Um, going into the pandemic uh, as well, I, I appreciate being part of a government that has increased the province's a typical commitment to transit-oriented projects, transportation projects, to 40% of the capital cost. It had been pegged at uh, 30, 33% a third uh, previously. Um, we are coming to the end of the uh, uh, Mayor's Council 10-year vision, and we will look forward to renewing that uh, with uh, mayors uh, uh, this year. And uh, I think the federal commitments on funding, as well as our own uh, track record on funding, bode well to help the region come up with an exciting plan that will look to the future and the opportunities uh, to rebuild. So um, I want to uh, speak a little bit about a project that is definitely uh, a high priority for the Surrey Board of Trade and people who live uh, south of the Fraser more, uh, more generally. And that is uh, the commitment that we look forward to from our federal partners uh, getting approved on an expedited basis around the Surrey Langley Skytrain project. This is a key priority for our government. We've had some very productive discussions recently with, uh, with my federal counterparts, Minister McKenna among them. Um, about the importance of, 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 this, uh, of this project, what it represents 
the first uh, a major uh, rail-based uh, infrastructure project, transit infrastructure project south of the Fraser in about 30 years. And uh, I wish I had an announcement to make today, but what I, what I can say is that we have determined a, a pretty healthy high level of interest uh, from the federal government in what uh, this project represents in terms of uh, being able to shift people around to, to relieve some of the congestion problems that the introductory presentation spoke of, the, the latest survey of uh, Surrey businesses. And I know how important this project is to the, not only the mayor of Surrey, but uh, Langley and Langley Township. This is a tremendous opportunity for us to uh, make an, a, an investment uh, that will be significant in terms of its scale, uh, but uh, also the opportunity to try and accelerate it as best we can using the COVID economic recovery period uh, as an opportunity in that regard. Um, this is also a, a, an opportunity for our jurisdiction to show that we're taking serious action on, on climate change. So this represents a clean BC priority. Uh, and for that reason, uh, it will help us uh, meet some of our uh, GHG emission reduction targets. The other project I wanted to touch upon is the George Massey Tunnel. Uh, I know that's critically important, not just to those who are on this call, but people throughout the region and anybody who travels uh, throughout the Lower Mainland. Uh, Metro Vancouver uh, commuters uh, want and deserve a solution to the gridlock of that tunnel. And we are making uh, significant progress on that um, towards selecting the right solution for a new crossing on Highway 99 that aligns with regional plans. Uh, the business case on this one was delivered to me just uh, shy of uh, Christmas Eve. Um, government's actively reviewing that. We're working with our First Nations rights holders, uh, mayors that are sitting on the uh, task force that we established in 2019. And we've had some very good discussions as well uh, with our federal partners uh, on that project as well. It's, it's very helpful to have some heavy hitters in the federal cabinet who have uh, constituencies that are very near to Highway 99. And uh, what I can say is that we've had some really good discussions with Minister Qualtro and others uh, on, uh, on, on, on that crossing. Um, and uh, I am pleased to, to see that there's been some safety improvements to put in place the uh, LED lighting. I have, of course, not been able to travel, uh, but uh, the, uh, the northbound uh, LED lighting that was installed just this week, I think, has uh, had very good reviews and the southbound lighting uh, uh, project will uh, be completed in a couple of weeks time, uh, so early March. Um, let me conclude by saying this, uh, and we have uh, a lot of work to do. Uh, in our ministry, we are privileged to have a leading position in making investments that will activate supply chains, create jobs, and build back better as a province uh, by using uh, infrastructure projects to uh, uh, boost the economic activity uh, in the province as we go through a recovery period. We, we did see economic contraction. We were able to mitigate it. We were able to see uh, job uh, uh, creation uh, come back as a feature over the last nine months, which has been very strong. Uh, but we have a lot to build on. Um, we are going to make uh, significant investments in transit, uh, in ferries, uh, expanding operations at ports. We're seeing a lot of private investment in this province that is speaking to business confidence in BC's opportunities as we build back. Um, active transportation projects will be a key feature in a number of our communities. And we're also around BC upgrading uh, rural and forest service uh, roads uh, as part of our building back better. Um, we're committed to uh, adapting to and tackling climate change. And in fact, we just uh, launched a program called uh, Climate Adaptation. And we have 60 projects around BC that will protect uh, the highway networks from uh, the uh, adverse impacts of climate change, which includes floods and slides. And that has been an increasing disturbing trend. Um, these are projects that can make a huge difference in smaller communities. And it's a, it's, it will be a key feature uh, of our budget. And we have examples of those projects already starting in BC. Last, uh, last bit of very recent news uh, that comes from uh, the new year is uh, the formal start of the Broadway subway project. This is a significant $2.8 billion uh, project. It's now underway. It will generate many good local paying jobs. It will uh, get people uh, moving from east to west in the city and, and vice versa. But it also connects a significant uh, economic generating corridor uh, and, and the opportunity to boost that even further. This is uh, a major research and discovery corridor of both private and university-based uh, research, uh, significant uh, opportunity to increase uh, uh, affordable housing projects and reconciliation with the Musqueam, uh, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples and the Jericho land redevelopment. And I believe that uh, Minister State of Bowen Ma may have an opportunity to speak about that 
uh, project in a moment. But uh, I want to just say in closing, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Look forward to your questions and uh, look forward to working with uh, those uh, business leaders uh, and local government leaders who are on the call today. And uh, thank you very much and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Minister Fleming. And uh, please help me welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the BC Minister of State for Infrastructure, the Honorable Bowen Ma. Bowen, over to you. Thank you so much, Anita. And thank you, Minister Fleming. Good afternoon to everybody. I am coming to you live from my constituency of North Vancouver Lonsdale on the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil nations. Uh, as mentioned before, my name is Bowen Ma, and I serve as BC's Minister of State for Infrastructure. I'm also a professional engineer, a project management professional, and a graduate of the UBC Sauter School of Business. Having, having had the honor uh, prior to diving into the infrastructure portfolio alongside Minister Fleming, uh, I actually served as the Parliamentary Secretary for TransLink, which was a file that I was really grateful to be involved in, not only because I'm a total transit nerd, but also because of how critically important it is for our communities. So I'm really glad that in my role uh, now as Minister of State for Infrastructure, uh, I'm also able to work with George Heyman, Minister responsible for TransLink as we work to expand public transit infrastructure across the Lower Mainland. Now, Minister Fleming has covered a lot of ground already, uh, and I'd like to use some of my time to build on what he said about all of the elements that go into the development and creation of a strong transportation system. Because when it comes to issues of transportation, it's easy to fall into the trap of looking at transportation as though it's a closed system. We might imagine, for instance, uh, that the number of cars on a road is fixed. So when congestion levels, levels are high, the urge to add more lanes as a solution to that congestion can be very, very strong. But it's also a limiting and old way of approaching transportation. Indeed, Jurisdictions around the world have learned this the hard way that ever wider bridges, ever wider roads in a desperate attempt to offer relief to weary commuters, only, they only find that after all of that, even more traffic is induced by the ease of travel. And before you know it, the lanes are congested again. But the impact of congestion on people's lives is real. The frustrations are real, the time spent away from families are real, the impact to our economy is real, which is why being able to look beyond the pavement to what else is going on in people's lives is so incredibly important if we're serious about making life better for people in the Fraser Valley. Let's look, for instance, at affordability. You don't have to go very far in the Lower Mainland to hear someone talk about affordability as one of the top issues in that region outside of COVID-19. And in particular, you don't have to go very far to hear about housing affordability. The Lower Mainland is incredibly expensive. And as people seek affordable places to live, they're moving further and further away from economic centers into other regions of the province, including the Fraser Valley. But if the jobs that people hold are still in the Lower Mainland, then having people live further and further away from where they work puts more and more vehicles on the roads. The further people have to travel to and from work, to, to and from school, to and from the grocery store, the more time people are spending in their cars and the more time those cars are on the roads and therefore we get more cars on the roads. We, we know that traffic congestion in the Fraser Valley already frustrates people. But what may also prove to be true is that congestion problems in the Fraser Valley are intricately connected to housing affordability challenges in the Lower Mainland. And as it is, as it also is likely connected to the availability of family sustaining jobs in the Fraser Valley and to the availability of very important services within communities. So addressing the question of how we bring all of these elements together in a way that acknowledges growth and enables people to thrive in livable communities where people are able to choose to travel less or in different ways 
is how progressive transportation planning and development now looks like. And this is something that our government is going to be bringing to the Fraser Valley. We're going to be bringing this lens to the Fraser Valley. As part of BC's restart plan, we'll be doing a broader transportation study for the Fraser Valley to determine how we develop transportation networks in a way that enables solutions that support successful growth in the Valley for the people who live and work there now, as well as into the future. By working with local governments, indigenous partners, and other stakeholders, we want to support smart community planning by making sure that our transportation investments support forward-looking regional development that takes into account all modes of transportation, including active transportation, mass transit, and commuter rail, in addition to the car, pardon me. But in the meantime, we are also moving forward on transportation infrastructure projects as part of the largest capital program ever undertaken by British Columbia. And this includes the single largest investment in public transit expansion in BC history. Minister Fleming has already touched on the Surrey Langley Skytrain line, but a project like this one that has the ability to transform the region, I think it deserves to be talked about twice. Through no uncertain terms, our government made a promise in the last provincial election to build a new SkyTrain line through Surrey all the way to Fleetwood, and we intend to deliver. With pop population growth throughout the region, we know that public transit investments today will pay off dividends in the future. Given the realities of climate change, the desire for more socially responsible and, pardon me, more socially and environmentally responsible ways to get around, uh, that, that will only grow. And especially as younger generations are already more likely to drive less and more likely to seek out lifestyles with smaller carbon footprints. So enabling those lifestyles in the Fraser Valley will ensure vibrant communities that support the local economy. Over in Vancouver, on the Broadway subway project, the demolition of buildings to make way for six new stations and staging areas for equipment and materials is already underway. This site preparation work will continue into the spring when that work will then transition into major project construction. And I definitely look forward to being able to gather in person to celebrate the opening of the Broadway subway line in 2025. Over at the Potello Bridge, we're also making progress. In advance of major construction getting going later on this spring, initial in-river work on the main bridge tower has already begun. On land, the steel piles for the bridge foundation construction have been fabricated and crews are mobilizing on the south side of the Fraser River. And once the new bridge is completed, safety and reliability for drivers, for cyclists, for walkers will be improved, as will the movement of goods throughout the region. And while ever wider highways may not be a long term solution for congestion, it doesn't mean that there aren't important benefits to investments that make sure our highways are safe and have the appropriate capacity to support the movement of people and goods throughout a region. So last year, along Highway 1, we completed the new 200, 216, 216th Street interchange to improve local connections for communities in Langley. And we added high occupancy vehicle lanes between 202nd to 216th that reward people who choose to carpool or to travel by transit with faster commutes. Our government's next step is to further extend those HOV lanes to 264th Street. And when completed, there will be a 44 kilometer long section of HOV lanes stretching between Burnaby and Langley. This proposed project will also tackle uh, traffic flow or rather challenges in traffic flow by improving local by improving local traffic flow by reconfiguring the 232nd Street interchange and replacing the underpass at Glover Road, Glover Road and the CP rail crossing. 
So for those of you who are interested in that project, public engagement is underway through March 19th, and you can check out the project design online at engage.gov.bc.ca. Now, even with all this underway, we know that Surrey Board of Trade members will tell us that there's still more to do, and we definitely agree. Our government intends to continue our work to improve trade corridors so that they can sustain growth in commercial and industrial traffic, which of course helps, goods to, helps move goods to market and our resources to the world. And most importantly, especially in this trying time, we're going to continue to do what got us here in the first place. We'll be building BC back better by investing in projects, programs, and supports that put people first. So thank you so much to all of you for having me today and for having the Minister of Transportation, Minister Fleming with us. I look forward to your questions. Um, and yeah, back to you, Anita, thanks. Thank you so much, Bowen. And I have some questions uh, for both uh, you and Minister Fleming. Uh, so uh, just to respond in turn. Uh, so uh, in this BC budget that's coming up by on April 20th, I believe it is, and with the federal uh, government's commitment of close to 15 billion in infrastructure projects across Canada, will the BC government make a financial commitment to that Surrey-Langley SkyTrain all the way to Langley? I uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. And as you heard, uh, Minister Ma um, sort of remind uh, folks uh, that have joined us this afternoon, that, that was a very explicit uh, commitment that Premier Horgan uh, made uh, in October when we went into the election. We've always had an eye on this project and uh, have viewed it as a two phase project. Um, we've had some really good discussions with the federal government. The uh, in advance of the uh, announcement they made around a, a permanent uh, transit fund. So uh, what I would say is that uh, we'll continue to acknowledge and work with TransLink, uh, knowing that they have uh, skin in the game and a previous commitment, at least to the first phase of it. Uh, we want to look at the, we, we do look at this project as an opportunity to accelerate the economic recovery through uh, uh, as expeditious uh, a project as we can make it. So uh, Ottawa has been informed of our prioritization uh, of that. There still is a little bit of tidying up to do though. I just very briefly touched on the the Mayor's Council 10-year plan and um, they're still uh, committed to uh, dollars that are uh, originally allocated to an LRT project. Those need to be confirmed uh, in terms of a shift of priorities towards uh, Surrey Langley SkyTrain. We know that's the view of the region. We, we made uh, the commitment we did, the Premier made the commitment that he did uh, in acknowledgement of that. And what I can say is that uh, uh, this is going to be a, a partnership between TransLink, uh, the province of British Columbia, and the federal government. Uh, we think it fits perfectly with the announcement they made a couple of weeks ago, which was uh, oriented towards uh, transit projects that can move significant numbers of commuters uh, in climate-friendly ways. And, and, and this is, quite frankly, long overdue. Uh, and, uh, and so we hope to be able to uh, come back to the Surrey Board of Trade and uh, and, and make a significant announcement about that in the near future. But we do know for now that this is a very good fit. I just wanted to mention uh, that in our road survey uh, and uh, by many of our, our members, uh, there needs to be a significant link uh, between uh, SkyTrain construction and active transportation strategies. So that means cycling and walking, uh, enhanced livability. So whatever the official community plans are in terms of city design making for each of the cities and the, the towns, uh, that cross that SkyTrain, uh, there needs to be a collaborative effort to ensure that uh, both uh, assets are, are being linked. Um, yeah, I think I'll throw that one to Minister Ma if she wants to comment on that, and as well as uh, integrated transportation to, uh, services as well. So Anita, I have to admit, my, my feed froze out a little bit while you were asking your last question, but if we're talking about the importance of being able to connect various modes of transportation um, and, and develop complete uh, transportation networks that take 
all those modes into account, that is definitely something that our government is looking to, to bring a lens to in terms of um, a kind of integrated transportation planning over in the Fraser Valley. But I'll let you maybe clarify, because like I said, my, my audio cut out there. Yeah, absolutely. Technology. <laughs> what, what we're trying to do is ensure that people can cycle and walk uh, in addition to utilizing SkyTrain uh, to get around and uh, to ensure that uh, with the cities and towns that their official community plans are, are linked into those designs of whatever the SkyTrain construction is going to look like uh, with cycling and walking capabilities. Um, so that's what I was saying. Uh, my second question to either of you is, uh, tell me your thoughts about mobility pricing and road pricing strategies. Is that even realistic in the Metro Vancouver area? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, offer a couple of thoughts and then uh, Minister Ma might wanna jump in. I think we're open to any discussions as long as it's anchored in principles around fairness and equity. And the problem that we had with say the tolls that were only on the Portman Bridge and only on the Golden Ears Bridge was that they were inequitable. They were essentially a tax on some of the hardest working people in our province uh, who just for reasons of geography happened to live south of the Fraser and it was really a tax on getting to work or getting around the region that, that was not uh, equitable at all. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're looking at everything through the lens of affordability. Um, and uh, as we recover economically, uh, we'll continue to do that. There, there are a lot of people who have uh, suffered financial losses in their businesses, in their careers. Uh, it is not the time necessarily to layer on uh, new costs that would um, essentially be a, a tax on returning um, to their occupations and to their businesses. So. Uh, it, it, if I'm sounding a, a, cautious, a cautious note on there, it's, um, that's my take on, uh, on where our government would, would receive any of that. Having said that, always willing to listen to mayors and councillors who may have ideas on this. Uh, my next question is related to the pandemic and the trucking industry and the border itself. Um, you know, do you think that truckers that are going um, back and forth across the border, do they need negative COVID-19 tests? I, I could take that one. I, I think the short answer for that is what we have right now is, is, is working. The exemption that truck drivers have to get, um, to make deliveries into the States and return um, is working. It has not been a source of transmission. The, the trucking and transportation industry can be very proud of the fact that uh, the safe work practices that we established um, are, are effective. Uh, having said that, we will review these things as we need to. If we're getting into a situation where uh, more transmissible variants are affecting uh, the protocols that we have in place right now, of course, they would be revised. We've always committed to be flexible about that. Bowen, uh, when it comes to infrastructure and housing affordability, around uh, transit lines. Is housing really affordable in the Metro Vancouver area around uh, SkyTrain lines, um, especially for young people that are trying to get into the market? So what I would offer is that there are lots of young people who want to be able to make choices that don't, re uh, that don't revolve their lives around uh, being connected to, being tied to their vehicles. So lots of younger uh, families, lots of younger professionals are actively choosing more socially, environmentally um, modes of transportation. And that's what makes uh, housing near transit stations very desirable. But you're right, Anita, that just putting housing near transit stations doesn't necessarily make that housing affordable. It does require a concerted effort on behalf of not just local governments, but I would say the provincial government as well, to working with local communities to make sure that our transit investments actually produce the kind of community infrastructure that we want. And part of that community infrastructure that we're looking for, that we're, we're committed to as a government to trying to figure out how to leverage our investments to create is affordable housing. But 
yeah, I mean, if we don't, then the housing is not necessarily affordable. Minister Fleming, how are you and the BC government uh, maybe specifically the transportation board working with the taxi industry. Uh, they have faced significant challenges during this pandemic. What are your thoughts on that industry? Yes, they have indeed. And uh, we have met with the industry a, a number of times and we are looking at uh, ways that we can assist them with their high overhead costs and the fact that for the foreseeable future, there is there are not going to be international visitors. There are not going to be conventions. There are not going to be major events. There are not going to be demands um, for taxi service. And the approximately 60, 70% decline we've seen is likely to continue uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. So we have worked with a number of other uh, heavily affected businesses uh, that are in the transportation sector. Uh, we have a commitment to, to work with the taxi industry as well. We did lower uh, and also reform uh, ICBC products that have reduced costs. There have been some federal programs around wage subsidy and other things. Uh, and some of our smaller companies have benefited from the small and medium sized business innovations that we've done. But um, let's put it this way. We've put a number of items on the table. We've had some really good frank discussions with the taxi industry. Our goal as a government is to help uh, the taxi service uh, survive the pandemic and do well into the future. And we acknowledge that for the time being that those tough circumstances are gonna be there. So we, we do have to do more uh, for the taxi industry in the coming months uh, to help them uh, weather this, uh, this very difficult period. Just gonna go two minutes over time, ladies and gentlemen. I have two more questions. Uh, Minister Ma, Surrey, as you know, is a car oriented uh, community due to a lack of transportation options. What are your thoughts on increasing electric charging stations, electric infrastructure, isn't that only going to increase congestion? So, Anita, I appreciate this question because there's, uh, it indicates an appreciation for the concept of induced demand in that when you make it easier to travel by a certain mode of transportation, you actually induce even more travel by that mode. Um, and you're right though. Car, Surrey is a very car oriented place. And so cars are still going to be very important to people and families in the region. And given that it's important that we work to electrify the cars that people are driving as quickly as possible in order to meet our climate goals. A big part of that is being able to, uh, or pardon me, a big part of being able to do that depends on our ability to actually enable people to choose to purchase EVs over gas powered vehicles. And that's why we're really excited to be investing in and increasing the number of electric charging stations with the recent announcement of 40 additional EV stations. Uh, in terms of the impact on congestion though, I, yeah, like an EV takes up the same amount of space as a gas powered vehicle. It's, it's not a, a panacea for all of our congestion problems in the lower mainland or the Fraser Valley, but that's why we need to look even beyond the pavement to public transit, to active transportation infrastructure, to looking at housing affordability and the impacts on how that um, how that affects our lives. So all of this comes into play, but EV stations and EV charging stations are definitely a very important part of our work. Minister Fleming, when will the South of the Fraser transportation table uh, commence? I was announced prior to the pandemic, we lobbied for it. Uh, when will that start? Yeah, we have, um, we have some meetings, I believe that are scheduled to resume shortly. Um, it has led to, the table has led to some improvements on the Alex Fraser uh, bridge. So the the, um, the zipper system that's in effect there, as well as uh, we just took the wraps off our uh, Fraser River Advanced Travel um, Traveler Info System. So there's there's 13 of those signs now on key corridors. These were all things that were uh, suggested by the original uh, transportation plan and consultation table. So we've been chipping away at some of the things that were identified, and uh, we we are looking forward to getting together again, talking about some of the additional priorities and some of the additional work that had been identified and some of the new things that have come to, into our range uh, since we've uh, gone through the pandemic. We're looking forward to that too. And Minister Fleming, Minister Ma, thank you so much for joining the Surrey Board of Trade. 
this afternoon. And remember that Surrey is an opportunity city.